Hi, I'm Resham Arden and this is the Now I Know podcast covering a wide range of wellbeing topics. With the cost of living on everyone's mind, I wanted to give people tips on financial resilience and some simple tools to feel in control of your finances. With me today is Carla Tucker, a financial advisor, the founder of Financen and the author of Financen The Foundation. I would like the audience to come away from today's conversation saying, now I know about financial resilience. Welcome, Carla. Thank you so much, Resham. Thank you so much for coming today. No problem. I know you and I have been in talks for weeks <laughs> trying to get a date in and juggle the kids, but we're finally I know. here. We're here, I know, right? Thank you. So <laughs> for the audience, please give them sort of an intro to yourself and of course. what you do. Sure. So I'm a financial advisor. I've been a financial advisor for almost 20 years now. It's the only job I've ever done, straight out of university. So um, when I graduated from university, I didn't... I didn't plan to go into financial services it wasn't the big dream to go into financial services and in fact I fell into financial services I studied Spanish and business management at university and had it in mind that I would go and I'd be traveling and going to Spain or South America and talking Spanish all day and doing some kind of sales type job I don't know I, that's what I kind of imagined that I would be doing um but it just didn't, that, that, that didn't happen. And I ended up, uh, my husband actually, uh, well, my partner at the time, who's now my husband, showed me a an advert in a local newspaper saying that a uh, high street bank were taking on trainee financial advisors and paying for all the training. So I thought, oh, I'm going to do that. So I did it. And I passed the exams within about six or seven months. And I've been a financial advisor ever since. Um, oh. So yeah, it's the, only, it's the only thing I've ever done. It's the only thing I've ever known. And I still... Um, I still really enjoy what I what I do. Um, so yeah, I've um, yeah, that's where I am in terms of what I do. Um, so mainly, what I do on a day to day basis is I advise people on how to manage their money, how to look after their wealth, how to. Um, I advise on savings and investments, retirement planning. I help people ensure they have adequate protection in place, and I also encourage my clients to be as tax efficient as they possibly can be. So that's my nine to five job. Aside from that, and you know the reason why I'm here today with you, Resham, is I also have a small business that I've started on the side called Finance Zen, and Finance Zen is all about bringing the knowledge and experience that I have from twenty years of being a financial planner to everybody because I do feel that there is still a lot of people that are not getting financial advice they're not getting in front of financial advisors or maybe they feel that they for whatever reason they don't feel comfortable with with that kind of whole setup with financial or taking financial advice a lot of people think that they don't have enough money to 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 be a client of a financial advisor which is which is a real shame because First and foremost, that's not the case. But also, you know, I'm I'm I suppose I'm on a bit of a mission with Finance Zen to bring that level of information to a bit more accessible and to everybody really. So for younger people, people that maybe haven't had much or haven't felt in control of their money or feel anxiety when they think about their money or just, you know, just just not just don't really understand what's going on with their finances. It's bringing a more um I suppose, you know, just trying to help build financial resilience in, in, in that sense. So that's what I'm really, really, I suppose, trying to do with, with this. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for that intro. Um, I've been following you on social media and I've seen some of your talks. And the reason why I really wanted you as a guest is I think you explain it very simply. Um, sometimes you. financial advisors, I think I could get a bit overwhelmed with some of the mm. information. But you you really explain it in really simple terms that, if, like you say, everyone can understand. Um, and that's why I really wanted you to talk about your book as well. I know you've got a book coming up. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really excited because I think, you you know, more people need to hear the simple mm -hmm. terms of, of finances. Yeah. So can you explain your book, what it's yes, about and what inspired you to write yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've written a book, which is out. It's available to, to, to download now and you can see it on my fun, on my Instagram page. Now, the reason I've, I've had an idea or the idea of writing an ebook for a number of years now, and it's just 
not been the right time for a number of different reasons for me to ever really get into it. I started trying to write it. I just couldn't get into the flow of writing. Um, and it was just a bit of a pipe dream that I would write this book. And it was going to be about what I consider to be the foundation of finance. So it's the real basics of financial planning. It's, you know, how to get into the right mindset for making changes in terms of your finance, which I think is a huge, huge part of sort of the process. It also then talks about how to set goals, how to you know what different instruments are so when I say you know what is what does it mean to um to save what type of accounts should be used you know what does investing mean what different what different types of investments that are out there and just the real basics of financial planning and what I was seeing when I was talking to clients every day was that lots of people didn't understand what a pension was lots of people don't understand what they've what income protection is what different types of investments are what an ISA is you know I was seeing that across the board people just don't understand what that means and I think when you don't understand something or if you you know it's not clear to how to you on how something works it's very difficult to engage with something and to really trying to get under the bonnet of something that you just feel that you don't understand and you maybe step away from yeah so the the inspiration for writing the book was very much you know wanting to bring my experience down to a level that was easy to understand, easy to follow, but most importantly, easy to implement. So strategies that people could adopt quite easily to follow. I started working at the company that I work at now, which is Insight Financial Associates. I joined them back in September 2019 and found out I was expecting my third baby a few months after. So it was a bit of a shock. It was a, a lovely surprise, but it was a shock all the same. I've just, you know, I've been self-employed for a few years my then four-year-old was just about to just started school so it was kind of like right I feel like I'm ready to get back into the kind of to the corporate world I suppose so I joined started this new job really loved you know the fact that I was working at Insights and a couple of months later found out I was expecting then we went into lockdown in March um went to homeschooling by this time I'm sort of four or five months pregnant I then you know went on maternity leave in the met in the June of that year and it was a really, it was, I found it a really difficult time. I was, you know, my, the birth of my son was quite traumatic and it was a very, very difficult time for me mentally to just, you know, just life in general, you know, having been pregnant in lockdown, homeschooling, not really being, you know, having that fear of, you know, not really knowing what you could and couldn't do, you know, didn't know if my husband was going to be able to come into the hospital with me, you know, it was lots of different things. And I found my, for the first time in my life, I'd suffered with really bad anxiety throughout my pregnancy. You know, once I'd had my son, my husband then lost his job very soon after, so within a week of having him, my husband suddenly lost his job and he works in the city as well. So for the first time in 20 years, we were both not working. You know, I was working, but I was on maternity leave, I'd just given birth a week before. And we went from a six-figure household down to statutory maternity pay within about a week. So it was a huge blow. And the inspiration from to write the book really did start then because you know I found myself in a position where I was struggling mentally, dealing with the, I think, the trauma of the birth and the pregnancy. Um, I did experience postnatal depression. I didn't see it at the time, but it, I was on a bit of a downward spiral. It, it did throughout that year. So from my son was born in the July. So towards the end of the year, I was it, it, by the end of the year, I was in a really, really bad place mentally. It was my younger sister that, you know, that said, look, you, something's not right with you here. Some, you know, I think you need to, you need to speak to someone. You need to, you need some help. You need to sort of look into sort of how you're acting. Because I, you know, the negativity that was around, that was all around me in my mind was very much coming out in relationships and things like that. So the inspiration for the book I started writing the book at that time. So I, I was, uh, by that time, my husband had started, you know, it, I think it was about nine months after my son was born, I went back to work. Things started to settle down. He was back at work again. And um, I started writing and it was part of my recovery. I think I, I see the book, writing the book as part of my recovery from postnatal depression. Mm -hmm. So I started writing and I really got lost in the journey of writing and having something that I was actually creating. And it took a whole new form. You know, it was just meant to be this sort of guide to how to manage your money. But actually, it was more than that by this point. It was actually, I've just been through something really traumatic 
in the after, but aftermath of having my son and my husband losing his job. You know, we had mm. access to credit, we had savings. But, you know, we're a five-person household. We've got bills like everybody else. We've got a big mortgage. Savings, you know, whatever savings you might have don't last very long when yeah. either of you are working for 10 months. So it's a, it was a really difficult time. There's a lot of anxiety, you know, that you know, we were both experiencing at that point. So it was, it was a great... Um, it, so when I started writing the book, it was really... It took a different tone and it took the tone of... Now I know why financial resilience is so important because had I started my journey into, you know, making sure that my financial resilience was really, really high, if I'd started investing earlier, if I'd started saving earlier, if I'd been more mindful about purchases and decisions that I'd made as an individual, yeah. even as a financial advisor, mm. I don't think that my depression would have been as deep and I don't think the impacts on us as a family would have been quite as strong had we had those things been focused on more from a from a yeah. younger age so the book is now the book that I wish I'd read when I was 18 and um, it talks about my experience in, in that time it talks about the mindset and it talks about being a, a more mindful approach to financial planning so that you can I suppose protect yourself against the the curveballs that life can throw yeah. and you know for us you know, a surprise baby was great. Don't get me wrong. It was, it was a, it's a blessing. And I know how lucky I am. But at the time it was like, whoa, okay. We've just come out of, you know, we just think we're going back into the, you know, the work, you know, the two full-time incomes and all of a sudden we're back in nurseries, yeah. fees and nappies. And, you know, so it was, it was a change and it was a great change, but it was one that we could adapt to. But what the more difficult one was, was the, the loss of both incomes at a very, yeah. at a very difficult time already. So the book is, come back to your question is the is what i believe to be the 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 foundation of any good financial plan that if it's followed and if it's yeah. adopted it will allow people to have that yeah. more financial resilience than they might have had and you know just a little bit stronger and able to deal with yeah. with crap that life yeah, throws absolutely. you know and and i think what you've just gone through is, is so relatable for so many people because lockdown we didn't really know how long it was going to last for so a lot of it was an unknown yeah the timing of it was an unknown mm. people were lost their jobs that was an unknown yeah they didn't know if they were going to get another job well it was, this or, is it. it took my husband nine months to find absolutely. another job and and don't get me wrong he was out there daily you know he's such a resilient man and i'm so lucky to have him you know yeah. and he but he was you know out there and it's you know it's also going to have an impact on him you know when you're out and you're trying and trying it all the time and the jobs are just one of the jobs in history in you know the field that he was in they're just people weren't hiring because companies understandably didn't know what was going on didn't know if they had the headcount or if you know if we were going to another lockdown all of those things were just so up in the air so it was a really difficult time it was a really difficult time so the book i know a lot of people talk about um you know, journaling to help them with mm. their well-being. So this book's a bit sort of like your healing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. It really was. And it's funny because when I, when I was finished and, you know, because I'm a financial advisor, I'm a regulated advisor, of course, um, when you write a, anything financial, any kind of financial publication, it has to go back, it has to go and be approved and signed off by sort of FCA compliance mm -hmm. to make sure that it's relevant and it's correct and it's accurate. And so, it, you know, I, I kind of gave it over and, to be checked and they were like right can you add in something here and I was like I found it really hard to go back into it I, it was almost I, I really missed the process of doing it and I found it really difficult to then go back in and change yeah because it was done it was kind of done yeah. and I found it you know and I was in that that state of doing it on a regular basis like every Friday I'd come home from work and I'd literally pour myself a little mini miniature glass of wine and I'd literally write until like one two in the morning and it was I just loved the process of doing it oh. but I, when it was done I was like oh my god what do I do now on a Friday night I was oh. like, yeah. I did, you know I really enjoyed it and it, I do feel that it was it was really quite cathartic in that sense to go through and to to be writing something especially because it had more of a focus now. It wasn't just a plan. It wasn't just a strategy. It was actually, this can stop, this can help people avoid the financial stress that can come from not being well prepared for yeah. life's unfortunate events. Yeah. And having been through that, I mean, you know, we were talking about before we came here, weren't we, over coffee about the universe and how things happen for different reasons. And I do feel that I was meant to experience that. That experience was meant for me. Yeah. Because I've been able to now 
articulate that experience and really really show why it's so important that yeah. people get the understanding and improve the financial literacy that they improve the financial resilience because I've lived through it and as a financial yeah. advisor you know and someone that has done things the right way and had savings and had investments and still you know it can when the rug is pulled from underneath you yeah it is it, it, it's life-changing yeah. so for people maybe that don't have that and you know just to throw a number out there um Liverpool Victoria one of the biggest insurance providers in the UK LV done a have put together some research recently that suggests that 49% of workers have less than 5000 pounds in savings now if you're out of work for 10 months with a family and you've got less than 5000 pounds of savings yeah that is going to have a huge impact on yeah. your life on your mental health on your ability to do the things that you want on your dreams on your aspirations on your your mental state for your children so it's just so important and especially now with the cost of living going up as you said and mm. you know all of these things it's it's really yeah. it's really important. and I think that's probably where, where your book stands out from everyone else because not only are you talking from my financial advisor place but you also talk in a place of like I've been there like I've experienced yeah. it and this is how I got out of it as well yeah so I think you know you're like you said you know you're meant to go through this and your story can be shared with so many people so I'm so glad you got this oh, book <laughs> and you're on you. the podcast so we can reach more people thank and you. just see how, how you did that but when I followed you I one thing I really took away from what you said was um the roundup method and you talked about it and I think you know you can explain it a bit better than me but for me the roundup method was like a little way of putting some money aside sort of like unconsciously mm -hmm. um, and a single mum I like I, you know I've got my two kids and I sort of I don't want them to think like oh my mum's a single mum she can't afford a holiday I don't want them to ever feel mm -hmm. like that so yeah, I was like how can I save up without feeling the burden of the day and I really mm. loved your talk about the roundup method mm -hmm. could you explain to the yeah, audience a bit more about it and how yeah, we benefit from it because course. for me it was it's like an unconscious way of saving well this is it and I think one of the things that I wanted to bring out in the book was making is the power of small things the power of doing small things so investing a small amount from a young age will turn into a big amount in the future and you know just making small changes to your day making small changes to your habits can have monumental impact on us you know in, in all different parts of our life you know if you're <clears throat> you know getting up every morning and doing 10 minutes of meditation or going for a 15 minute run every day will start to compound yeah um the roundup method is one of the things that i talk about in the book as a way of building up more savings in a really easy way and you know when you're just doing your normal spending you know going out and about it's just saving up or rounding up loose change you can call it so it just if you're if you're buying something that's 70 pence you'd round up to a pound and 30p would go into a savings pot so it's a really good way for people to save without feeling that they're saving i mean i don't yeah. think it's the only thing that people should do yeah you know, you should have your structured savings and your transfers into your savings accounts or your investments alongside, but it's another great way. It's quite a fun way as well. Yeah. Um, and I started doing this about four years ago with a company um, online. I'll say who it is. It's Moneybox. I started doing it with, you know, about four years ago. And I was just, you know, just every week, once a month, yeah, every week, I think a direct debit sort of comes out of my account for the amount of roundup. And I totally forgot all about it. I don't even think I had the app on my phone. And I went back in there like a year and a half later and it was like a couple of grand in there. Yeah. I, it, this was money that I had not even noticed going out of my yeah. account. So it's a really good way. It's quite a fun way to to save. And I think if you're if you're feeling that maybe things are tight at the minute and you that you are feeling this, the pinch of, you know, really trying to save as much as you might want to, you know, you might there just might not be much left at the end of the month. And I, I do feel that for a lot of people at the minute. There just isn't much left. Yeah. So rounding up just small change, it gives you that feeling that you're doing something. And when you can see something building, yeah. it's, you know, it kind of encourages you to continue yeah. to do it. Because so. like, the reason I say it, I, it's why I feel like it's a very unconscious way of saving was it because is. I did it and I actually forgot about it. Yeah. And the other day I, I saw something and I was like, oh, roundup method. Let me see how much I've got. And I had like, over a few weeks, I had like 200 pounds. I totally forgot that I even yeah. had it there. So it's a, it, yeah. like you say, as well as other stuff, it's quite like a nice little thing. It's to quite have. nice because it's it, because it's money that you're missing. You know, you can justify 
doing spending it on whatever you want something that makes you feel good you know some self-care treats for the kids you know it's just that it gives you that feeling of that guilt-free feeling spent you know when you save something up unconsciously it's like oh my god that's like a bit of a bonus there yes you could you know don't get me wrong if you've got some high interest debt or things like that and i know we'll talk about that in a moment but Mm. if you've got debt and things like that it might be best used there but you know if you save something you know like that and it's been easy to save and you haven't noticed it absolutely enjoy it and treat yourself so that (laughs) brings us on to um our savings yeah. and like the, the dilemma people have so say for example um a question i get a lot because people knew i was going to be interviewing you they sort of said um can you really ask carla this question which was <coughs> should we be should we be saving when we have credit cards and loans to pay off like what do we do first or can we do it together yes i think well the, the answer my answer the short answer is it depends okay. i think so from experience you know one one of the strategies that I recommend in the or that I talk about in the book is splitting your income down to in in a, in a quite a set way. So you would have you, you you if we let's say that you're you get paid. Let's just make it really easy. Let's say that you get paid a thousand pounds a month. All right, and your essential bills are five hundred pounds a month. You've then got five hundred pound left. Now, of that five hundred pound left, after all of your essentials are gone, and by essentials I mean rent, mortgage, council tax, utilities, food travel, childcare, those sorts of essential bills. Mm -hmm. I suggest that people break that down. 50% of what's left should go to saving off debt, paying off debts, Mm -hmm. saving for a deposit, whatever it is that you might be the long-term savings goals, but paying off debt should be a priority. Okay. And then 25% for for fun and 25% for short-term savings. Now that could be, when I say fun, I mean going out, just lifestyle you know going out for dinners going out for lunches things like that Mm -hmm. 25% into your short-term savings should be for maybe building up an emergency fund which might prevent you from using credit so much in the future if you've got some emergency savings yeah um but then that 50% should be totally put into if you've got high interest debt then you should or, or any kind of debt really you should certainly be putting a good chunk of it towards that now not all debt is created created equal things like student loans and mortgages you know you might be quite comfortable just having those continue to tick off in the background especially if they're not super high interest rates when people have high interest credit cards store cards things like that that are costing quite a lot in interest they should absolutely be a priority because we have to look at the maths behind it as well so if you can imagine that you've got a credit card that is costing you 22 percent interest a year but the alternative is to save into an investment that might get you 10% a year. Well, the maths are clear. You know, you should be saving, paying down on the debt. I do think that there is space with a good financial strategy to do a bit of both. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, what I find is that when people say, right, I'm just going to pay off all my credit cards, I'm going to pay off loads every month on my credit card. What ends up happening is they end up back using the credit card halfway through the month because they've paid too much in. And then the psychological impact of not getting any further. Yeah keeps them in the debt for longer. So what I say is make sure the essential part of your essential bills should be minimum repayments on debt. And then when you do your, when you, when you calculate what you should have, what's left. And again, it talks about this in the book and I've got some tools and things to help you work all this out. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there should be enough left to make additional payments that will help you pay off debt quicker. But definitely, definitely i think there is a there is space for both but i think it depends on the individual circumstances it depends on how much money someone's earning yeah. and it also depends on how much interest you're paying on those loans and there's a couple of different repayment methods as well different ways that you can pay down debt different strategies that you can use with, again which are explained more in the book um one of which is the snowball method which is where you start um you pay off the smallest balance first. So let's say you've got a credit card with 500 quid on one with a thousand, you'd pay off the two, the, you know, the, the smaller one and then you start on the bigger one and then the bigger and the bigger. So it's kind of snowballing up. And then you've got the avalanche method, which is where you start with the most high interest debt and then you work downwards from there. So you pay more money into the thing that is most, most expensive. Oh, okay. Personally, I think that the avalanche method makes more sense because you're paying more money into something that's costing you mo- more interest initially mm-hmm. and then working downwards from there. So if you've got a, a high interest credit card, then you've got a store card, then a loan, then a student loan, start at the most expensive, right. focus on paying off that quick as quickly as possible and then 
you kind of transfer the balance or the amount that you are saving into that account to the to the sort of cheaper accounts yeah. if that makes if that makes sense so you're kind of starting at a higher point and moving yeah. down in terms of the interest so yeah. i think there's space for both okay it's good to know get the book guys check out the avalanche <laughs> method <Yeah. laughs> um so something like you know this at christmas there was lots of uh let's say bad press about mm-hmm. the sort of pay in three you know like mm-hmm. Klarna and paypal yeah. and like i know lots of the like my younger f- friends and cousins that did this whole let's pay in three it's great you know it was mm-hmm. great for them mm-hmm. but there's a lot of bad press about the pay in three what's your view on this <clears throat> pay in three method okay right so I'm, I'm a little bit i'm very on the fence with the whole pay in three um the whole pay in three strategy for buying something don't get me wrong i've used klana i've used clear pay i've used mm. all of those things where it's a larger purchase that just makes more sense to pay over three mm-hmm. sometimes you know you might not be able to afford a larger purchase in one hit but but you need it now for example um but like any lending or any kind of financial agree- finance agreement which it is a finance agreement you just have to be sure that you can maintain the con- you know the terms of the of the borrowing you know if it's klana and it's paying over three months make sure that you are able to pay it in three months because yeah. it's when things don't go to plan and when you start missing payments that that becomes more of an issue. It's going to have an impact on your ability to borrow in the future. If it then starts going down the debt collection route, then of course that could is going to leave some really hard uh, messages on your credit file. But I can see how easy it is to serve a purpose and I do feel like in some cases it can be a good way to, 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 to spend or to pay for things. Um, also, not many of, I don't think all of the sort of buy now, pay later companies, they don't all feed into all of the credit report agents, reference agencies either. Some of them do. Mm-hmm. Some of them go to some. I can't remember which ones do which, but they don't all feed into the credit reference agencies. But having said that, you it should still be something that you wouldn't really want to go into unless you know that you can, that you can definitely pay it off, just like any financial agreement. I... The issue that I have with buy now, pay later, and just a very quick Google search on Klarna's website will show this information. Klarna market the fact that people spend 45% more by a pay later method than they would have done if they didn't. That for me rings alarm bells because if we're spending 45% on average more than we would have done for the purchase that we went onto that website to buy, yeah, then that's probably mindless spending, which is exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to achieve with with, with the work that I'm doing with the book. So if we're going out to spend, buy something that's 100 quid and we're spending £145 on it, mm, yeah, because we're picking up other bits because we're going to spread it over three payments, that's money that should be going elsewhere. Yeah. That's money that probably could be going into different things because it's probably something that we don't need. Yeah. So it's that coming back to that mindful spending and the mindful managing of money and when we're spending 45 pounds to buy at 45 quid more than we need to to spend something that you know to buy something that might have if we'd saved up for the 100 pound item we wouldn't have bought those extra things yeah. it's going to make me feel that it's probably a mindless purchase or an unnecessary purchase yeah. and it's I'm not saying for a second that we shouldn't have those purchases but what I'm saying is that we should buy them or spend the money spend on them in the most appropriate way yeah. it might be better for somebody that wants to spread their cost over a period of time to get a zero percent credit card for example yeah. so that might be a better way to spread because it's you know you can might be able to spread it over a longer period of time it's interest free it might be lower cost yeah. and you know when you're going to buy something and you yes even though it's on a credit card you might still just buy the one thing rather than the extra 45 yeah. percent of of, of, of items that you might not have mm-hmm. needed and you're right, I think, because at Christmas, people thought, oh, because it's over three, I will just buy oh, more yeah. things. But really, they had to pay it in one go. They probably wouldn't No, no they wouldn't. That. No, because if you had it in your hand and you said, do we really need this? And you you had your amount in your hand to spend or you had cash in your pocket, you probably wouldn't have bought those things. Yeah. You know, so one of the, you know, the strategies that I've got in the book of of making sure that we're building up, that we've got our, our essential bills covered, that we've then got our long-term savings in place and our debt repayment strategy sorted we've got our short-term spending so short-term goals met so you know your friend's getting married next year well we're going to put money away for that we're going to save for christmas those sorts of things yeah if we're doing things in the right way and we're being mindful about our saving and our spending patterns we hopefully should be able to you know wait a month or so and buy the item that we want if we've got those if we're you know being a little bit more mindful about how we're saving thank you 
I think, like you say, just have to be a bit more mindful. Yeah. Really, like, yeah. sometimes people sort of say, put it in the basket, and if you really need it a few days later, you know, like, sometimes you don't actually need it. You know, it's, it's a I, I, think that's, I think that is a, I, I think that's a great method, and it's something, again, that I do suggest in the book, is that, you know, if you are, if you, if one of your, if you know you're a spender, and you like, if you've got the magpie syndrome, and that you see something shiny and new, you have to have it, just try and get into the habit of saying, okay, right, I'm not going to buy it today. I'm going to sleep on it and I'm going to think about it and I'm going to come back in three days' time and see if I still really, really want it. Half yeah. the time, you probably won't. It's the impulse. It's, it's, that, impulse buying, it's, yeah. that, it's that dopamine hit that we get from something new. It's also, a, I think, a case of, well, what other ways can we get a dopamine hit? You yeah, know, well, how else can we get that dopamine hit? Can we pick up the phone to a friend that we haven't spoken to for a little while and get the dopamine hit from them? Or can we go and have a nice, you know, make a nice meal? Or can we go and get in nature or do an exercise class or yeah. pick up a hobby? Are there other things that we can do to stop that that high that we get from purchasing? Interesting. It's funny you say that because sometimes when I'm on my own, mm-hmm. that's the time I sort of think, oh, let's just... Have I'm a little look. Yeah, and, like, and you're right. It's like trying to keep busy and like find another way. That's, that's such look, a good way of looking at it. I all, love that. We're all guilty of it. You know, I've got the Zara app is the first one, <laughs> one of the first things on my phone, you yeah. know, and we all, you know, we all like to have nice things and we, you know, we want to, you know, th- th- there's nothing wrong with that. But yeah. I just think it's that, that, that extra layer of thought that goes into one, do I need it? Yeah. Two, how am I going to pay for it? And three, um, is this the most appropriate way to pay for it? Yeah. You know, is you know, do I re- do I really want to get myself into a finance agreement for something that I don't need? Yeah, absolutely, love that. Thank you. Um, so something um, I, I I've sort of listed a lot of podcasts of mm-hmm. financial sort of well being, um, and something they talked about was um, I've got the lady's name, but she talked about we need to educate more people on the credit scoring. But it's not yeah. it's not that the sexy thing to talk about in terms of mm. money. So you know, should we do more to educate people on the importance of credit scores? Because no one really talks much about that. Oh, gosh, yes, um, yes, absolutely, we should. There is a lot of information, there's a lot of good resource online about credit scores and why it's important. It's an area that I talk to my clients about so much. You know, I talk to them about talking to their kids about credit scores and about you know it's something that I talk to my sons about I've got three boys as you know my eldest is 13 and you know as he's getting older I will be talking to him so much more about what credit well already I'm talking to him about what credit means and what a credit score means and and why it's so important to have a good credit score because it will open up opportunities to you in the future that you know that you won't be able to get if you don't have a good credit score it's as simple as that um but they are you know, there, there are a number of things that, you know, quick fixes that you can do to improve your credit score. And the few things that I would sort of suggest when it comes to credit scoring would be, you know, checking first and foremost a, a credit report and making sure that all your information is correct and updated, that your right address is on there. Especially if, you've, if you're renting and you've moved a lot, it, it, it's, things can get missed off or you might have an old address on there. or So there's certain things that you can do to try and maintain a credit score. Making sure you're on the voters' roll as well will definitely help. You know, part of my, you know, I've, I've been a mortgage, I am a qualified mortgage advisor as well. So, you know, one of the, these are the sort of things that I would talk to my clients about before they're looking to get a mortgage. And like, right, these are the things that you need to be working on for the next six, 12 months before you start getting ready to maybe put an application in. Um, avoid multiple applications if you've been turned down for credit. So if you do apply for credit and you're turned down, just wait don't tr- keep trying different places because it does kind of have an, an impact on your score. Also, um, of course, making monthly payments on time is important to ensure that you can keep your credit score up. But also asking your landlord or your housing association if you're renting or, you know, the council if you're renting from the council, asking them to, to reference the credit agencies or you know, to let the credit reference agencies know that you're paying your rent on time. That can really help okay. as well. That's something that a lot of people don't do yeah. and it is something that is possible. Um, and, you know, a lot of people also think that if you don't have credit, that you have a good credit score. In order to have a good credit score, you need to have credit. So it's important to understand that, you know, and, and you know how credit works and uh, you know how a credit card could be a really great way to to build up your credit score for example um you could just use it for one purchase you might use it for for petrol for example you use your credit card put all your petrol in the car for the month yeah. you pay it off when you get paid so it's not a huge bill something that you'll be able to afford to cover but it's showing what you're doing is you're showing the lenders that you can manage credit that you can cope with a credit facility but you don't rely on it to live right, that's what's really yeah. important 
That's interesting. Yeah, I think um, that's something I think, especially a lot of people now that are trying to sort of buy their homes, mm-hmm. they're trying to build up their credit scores. I think that's going to be really useful mm-hmm. in your book to sort of teach them. So I'm a big fan of The Apprentice, right? Mm-hmm. And um, <coughs> I follow Tim Campbell from The Apprentice a lot. Okay. And, you know, he does, he talks a lot about the financial, you know, resilience. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, your book's called The Foundation. And I really believe that, you know, I wish when I was at school they they spoke about exactly what mm-hmm. you're teaching us and I think yeah. it's great. So Tim Campbell from The Apprentice talks about how he's giving back to the school he went to by talking to kids about the importance of financial literacy and how to manage a budget. So what else do you think small businesses can do to support schools in teaching kids about how to manage their finances? Ah, right, this is such a big it's this is such a big mammoth task, I think, because sadly most of us didn't, like you say, Resham, and I didn't either. Most of us will n- learn about money from our parents. And it's all going to well if your parents came from, you know, were educated in finance or knew about how to manage money. But if they didn't, when you get to 18 and you get your first job or 21 or whatever the age you go out there in the world, it's going to be a nightmare because you're not going to understand what to do when you get your first paycheck. You're not going to understand how to allocate that money. You're not going to understand how to manage that. You're not going to understand how to set yourself allowances for different things. And I think that the education system, you know, we're learning about how to work out areas of a triangle, but we're not under- lurking, working, yeah. we're not learning in maths about how to set a budget, create a budget and, and analyse financial accounts and things like that that might be a lot more useful to someone in their life. Yeah. We're not taught, taught, taught about tax. We're not taught about anything like that. Um, and I think, I do think the, turn, the, t- the tide is turning. I think that there are companies and charities, especially, that are coming, that are, you know, are putting things together and going into schools. Some banks are. I think NatWest might be doing something with Twinkle, you know, their sort of children's uh, educational yes, tools. Yeah. Um, there might be, so, so there are definitely companies that are going in and seeing this as an opportunity to really, to, to, to educate and lift the overall levels of literacy in terms of finance. There's still a long way to go. One of the things, you know, there's lots of people like me that want that are really passionate about helping people elevate from that that level, whether it's yeah. at school age or, you know, I'm, I'm interested in the sort of 16 to 21 year olds. That's the area that I feel is most important. Don't get me wrong, from a young age, yes, but they're the ones that are going to be going into the world now or getting, you know, yeah. maybe getting their first job. But it's not just for small businesses, it's for big businesses. And I always I always wonder whether banks are really that bothered. You know, big banking corporations could very easily put yeah. together huge packages to put out to schools. Yeah. But do they really is it in their business interest yeah. for people to be better with money? Because the amount of money that banks make from charging overdraft fees amount of money that they charge they that they earn from credit card fees and, and interest that they charge on loans if everyone was really really astute with their finances and you know manage their money really really well yeah. they wouldn't make half <laughs> the amount of profits no, that they right. do yeah. so what how much incentive is there for a bank to do that to kind of almost could change the whole you know that the, the the profitability of their business if everyone was doing it correct or doing things better yeah. so i do think that there is a lot to do um i think from a company perspective um what i'm seeing is that lots of you know more businesses are realizing that this is something that they need to provide for staff members as well and i think my you know my view is that we teach we need to be the ones to teach our children we need to be the ones that need to say right i need to learn about money i need to understand my money more because then when you understand your money your children will pick up on the fact that you understand your money talk to your kids about money absolutely talk to them about it give them the chance when you're out to go and pay for things you know give them physical cash tell them to go and pay for things and work out how much change they're going to get they love it you know my kids love handling cash you know like going out and spending and having control of an amount and saving so I think education starts in all different levels, but there's a company that I'm really happy to be partnered with called Mindful. And Mindful are a consultancy-based firm that go into businesses and talk about how to develop wellness strategies for a company. So they will redesign their wellness approach Mm. in terms of physical um, resilience, in terms of mental and, you know, mindfulness, but also financial. And I'm really pleased to speak to be the person that's going you know that's partnered with them to deal with the financial resilience for these firms and to increase the level of knowledge that we have around money um because i feel that if these people are going home feeling empowered about their money and how to manage it 
then that's going to naturally trickle down to the children and that will be another way to lift lift the levels of literacy. Absolutely. You're right, I think, you know, people are... It is changing, slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember, like, so my daughter, she's uh, 14 mm-hmm. and, you know, she was at that age where she started in high school and I was like, do I... I want to give her cash because then cash, like, you can really see the money mm-hmm. but when you just tap a card, it just doesn't feel like yeah. anything. Yeah. But then I realised <laughs> it was just the safety, it was easy, I could track it so she's got, like, a, a Revolut app, you know, yeah, card yeah, and, you know, it was all about... Um, you know, helping her understand. But to me, it was great mm. because when she'd be out, I could see like, oh, she's here. She spent that. Yeah. Um, but she'd know like how she would. She's great. She's like, mum, how much have I got my card? I tell her. So she's like, okay, that's my budget. Oh, okay. You know. And you're right. They're really thinking about it yeah. now. By like, this is your budget for today and how they spend yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and also, I give her like five pounds a week, and like that's her money towards like trainers or makeup. And then yeah. she'll be like. Oh my god it's taken me like three months to <laughs> yeah, save for trainers yeah. but you know when they ask well bank actually, of mum and dad it's yeah, like they want it now, this is know? it and I, you know i definitely agree with you i think that's a great strategy with kids and giving them the chance to save for things because when they then say to you mum can i have those 180 pound i'm like uh mate no you can't because yeah. how long are you gonna have to save to are you gonna have to save five pound a week for to buy those trainers what you know yeah so we've got a you know what i like them to do is maybe even if they saved half yeah and, and then we the might half. say okay well you get to 50 percent, and then we'll you know yeah. you can have a little bit of birthday money towards it or you know there's, there's different ways that you can help them but i think it, it allows them to under to appreciate the value of money Absolutely. and the value of again small habits keeping that five pound and letting it build rather than going and spending it on v bucks or yeah, you know yeah. on or sweets or whatever it might be in a week that just keeping that money growing actually yeah, is is going to allow them to buy that something a little bit more yeah. impactful and i think i think we, we sort of forget that kids can see when parents are worried about money absolutely they, you know they might not say it but you know they no, feel it. i think we've all been there when we've seen our parents like struggling for something no, of course yeah. so i've always been quite mindful that i didn't want my kids to think we can't go without so for example when you know they're talking about all the energy prices going up and they were getting worried because it was all over the news yeah. and i said Kids, look, the way you can help mummy is switch off the light, <laughs> switch off the TV when you're not using it. That's all mm. you've got to do, you know, so they don't worry, but they can mm. still have an they can, impact. Yeah, on, of course, on they can contribute. Things. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Carla. This has been really insightful and I'm really excited with your book and how no it all problem. goes. Thank but, and you I think so it's, much. it's also happened not only for the right timing for you, but mm. I think for the right timing for everyone because of the cost of living. I think it's so yeah. important, which is why I really wanted you here. Thank you. Um, so I have a closing question, mm. which is you've sort of touched on it already, actually. Um, so I would like the audience to come away from the podcast to say, now I know about financial resilience. Mm-hmm. Um, what have you learned in your recent years about managing your money that you wish you knew when you were younger to help you overcome? the challenges you faced definitely starting saving and investing as soon as I got my first job putting some money away understanding investments and putting money into some kind of investment linked account you know stock market linked investment mm-hmm. um, through some sort of stocks and shares ISA something like that even if it was 20 pound a month you know, the impact of doing something small over a long period of time, the compounding effect of that yeah. is massive. And, you know, it's the one thing that I will insist on my boys doing is making sure that whatever they've got coming in, if they're still living at home, I'd be like, right, okay, that's going to be going in to be invested for you, for your yeah. future. Um, and uh, yeah, just to not underestimate the power of small change, you know, because I think sometimes we... We, are f- we, we, we want the big change. We want the big impactful change immediately. We want to see the results straight away. But actually, the journey of doing something small and seeing it grow actually yeah. is is so much more, um, has so much more of an impact on somebody. Absolutely. I think in so many different senses. I talk to my kids a lot about the compound effect because, yeah. you know, you want everything now in that yeah. real time and, you know, like going to the gym and like, you know, meditation. And I do a lot of sort of gratitude and I talk about, you know, it's, it's the small things. And I talk to them, it's about like, we're just planting a seed right now and yeah, soon it'll go cool. into a tree. So yeah, absolutely. it's trying to be I love patient, that. isn't it? Like, yeah. you know, and you're right. I think for me, is I've I've uh, learnt the hard way, the financial mm, struggles, me, but yep. I've got them in the end. But yeah. I think if we can teach our kids, you know, the, the, the right way, I think it, I think this is is really um, the future is bright. Absolutely. Know? Um. So thank you so much. So remind everyone thank how you. they can reach you, like your social media well, page. My website. social media is finan underscore zen <laughs> yeah. underscore actually. But again, we'll be on the you know we'll put it in the notes of the podcast. I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you can find me on Instagram mainly, but I'm also on LinkedIn. So you can look me up on LinkedIn, Carla Tucker. Um, yeah, that's it. And there's a, there's a link to buy the book there if you Excellent. want. Well, good thank luck you with the so book. Much. I think it's going to help lots of people. Thank you. And you're doing so much for everybody. So thank you. Thank you so and much, Thank Rashan. you for being on the podcast. No, thank you for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.